And thank you very much for having me, Rasika. It's, it's been really fantastic um, being part of this um, series. Let me just pause and concentrate on getting my tech right. Let's click on that. Now then, how does that look? And then let's um, go present a view. Good. Do we have a PowerPoint? Yes, we do. Good. That's what we like. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's such a great series, Rasika. Um, and attending a couple of the previous talks has really given me a lot of food for thought, and has been taking my thinking on this topic in in new new directions. It's very good to think about questions around. Uyghur culture at a time of intense securitization and repression, as you've explained, uh, in terms of economics and capitalist structures. Uh, this is really quite new territory for me, so um, please bear with me um, and I will dive in. Um, but first, um, uh, I just want to say a thank you to the photographer Patrick Wack. Um, I've borrowed quite a lot of his really beautiful uh, and insightful images from the region uh, taken in 2020. I think they really help to um, say things visually about what's going on at the moment. Okay, there we go. So there are problems with talking about this region. Uh, the region known as Xinjiang, quite often, also known as East Turkestan. Um, and the problems really about talking about this region are exactly that, that kind of duality, um, the schizophrenia that we often experience in terms of the narratives around this region. So on the one hand, prim primarily from media and academics and Uyghurs based in the West, um, we have the revelations of mass incarceration beginning in 2017, an estimated 1.7 million Turkic Muslims interned in Xinjiang's rapidly expanded system of re-education and vocational training centers, also known as internment camps or even concentration camps. Um, and then subsequently the, the movement of tens of thousands of Uyghurs into conditions of forced labor when they graduate from these camps. Uh, uh, and this alongside the destruction of religious heritage and intense high-tech surveillance of the whole population. So this is one um, narrative perhaps familiar to some of you. Um, on the other hand, um, especially since 2019, we have a very different narrative, um, one that primarily issues from Chinese state-sponsored media. Uh, and this tells us that the region is now safe and happy and open for tourism. Uh, and this really marks the transformation of the Uyghur region uh, and Uyghur culture into a huge tourist theme park, attracting 200 million mainly Han Chinese tourists annually since 2019. So this is really the focus of my talk today. Um, I want to think through this duality, these oppositions, um, starting really from David Harvey's um, thinking on the, the geographies of capitalism, and particularly his call to theorize the relationship between the territoriality of political power and the spatiality of capital accumulation. Huh. Um, and I think this really helps us to understand how these very oppositional images and narratives really come together. So when we think about the role of music within this system, of course, there is also um, a very stark binary opposition. On the one hand, we have the narratives of cultural genocide. And on the other hand, the, the emphasis on Uyghur song and dance within the tourist framework. So I want to highlight really this dual use of music on the one hand within that system of the camps uh, and think about the use of music within the camps as part of a regime of self-reform underpinned by violence 
uh, and really um, I read this as a transformation, a project to transform Uyghurs into docile subjects, a laboring underclass at work in Chinese factories. Uh, so that's within the camps. And then outside the camps, of course, we see music and especially dance. Um, and I read that as a gendered and racialized form of effective labor to service the tourist experience. So this binary opposition in narratives really raises questions for academics and others, of course, about how to position ourselves. And increasingly, over these past five years, I've struggled with how to continue um, what I think is still the important work of raising awareness of keeping the, these issues in the public eye and pressing for international responses to the abuses that are going on in the region, but also um, to distance my critique of what's going on from the rhetoric of right-wing politicians in the US and the UK who typically frame what's going on in terms of state repression by communist China. So um, I think um you know one uh, one thing i really appreciate about being in this particular series is that it really helps to um clarify that problem um it's something i've addressed previously um through through a conference that we held uh, 3 years ago now uh, so as just before the lockdown um and this um the the conference is now published as a special issue of the online journal Society and Space. Ha. Uh, and this really brought together a group of colleagues um, to think through some of the links between what's happening in Xinjiang and wider, more global trends. So we were looking at questions of Islamophobia, the influence of the global war on terror coming from the US, um, and also, of course, uh, manifesting in many other parts of the world, including India, I would say, as well as China. Uh, and we were also looking at um, um, the global spread of surveillance technologies. Uh, so both um, the way that they are used to target Uyghurs uh, and the links to the use of this technology globally, from Kashmir uh, to my kid's school in North London, I would say. And in this, it's been uh, very instructive to draw on the work of Shoshana Zuboff on uh, surveillance capitalism. So, um, coming back to this particular talk and this particular series, um, I was really struck um, by the last talk um, by Andy McGraw um, and his characterization of the US penal system. Uh, if I can paraphrase him, um, he talked about how entire sections of the US community are habituated to mass incarceration as a way of life. Uh, of course, there is a substantial body of literature in the US reflecting on the role of um, jails and prisons as a social tool. Um, as the, um, and then the consequent um, dispossession of African Americans and the commoditization of black American bodies within this system. So all of this uh, is really extremely familiar to me uh, from my engagement with what goes on in the Xinjiang region, uh, I can really um, trace numerous parallels between the US system of incarceration and the camps in Xinjiang. Um, so, for example, the US rehabilitation programs that Andy talked about um, operate through systems of rigorous self-criticism and surrender to God. In Xinjiang, of course, um, we also have this very prominent use of um, self-criticism, uh, but um, surrender to the party, <laughs> to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, so I think really um, it's very helpful uh, for us to think about this system of um, re-education centers, stroke internment camps in Xinjiang, really as neoliberal facilities and part of a wider capitalist system which is now functioning in, in that region. So Andy McGraw, um, another thing that struck me particularly about his talk um, was, was his 
um, characterization of the wider experience of black communities in the US. Um, he asked, to what extent can the carceral atmosphere be felt outside the jail? Uh, and he, he answered himself, um, it is all encompassing, although it has different intensities um, from the school system, for example, to prisons. Um, and so I wanted to also emphasize this point in the context of Xinjiang, how the carceral atmosphere extends beyond the camps when graduates, um, graduates, those who are deemed safe to return to society, um, they are not free to return to their previous lives, but they are displaced, dispossessed, we might say, enlisted in forced labor schemes within Xinjiang and also um, moved to other parts of China and how um, their labor then is entangled in global supply chains for products ranging from clothing to solar panels. So all of this is very important um, background really to thinking about the question of song and dance within the tourist industry of Xinjiang. So um, I'm talking like um, there's a capitalist system at play in the, um, the Xinjiang region of uh, China. Is that um, okay? Um, in fact, um, this um, question of um, capitalism, of, of the regime in Xinjiang as capitalism has been extensively theorized by my uh, colleague, uh, Darren Byler, in his excellent new book called Terror Capitalism. And he delineates Xinjiang as a new state funded frontier of global capitalism. Uh, and he calls this political economic configuration then terror capitalism. And Byler and several other of my colleagues, uh, Sean Roberts among them, have traced these developments really um, back beyond the, the most recent crisis in the region. They, they've been looking at several decades of state-led projects of capitalist development in this region, which are really characterized by public-private partnerships between organs of the state and um, uh, and private Chinese companies principally. Um, and they are making links then between um, what they describe as settler capitalist expansion in the Uyghur region and new sequences of racialization. Uh, Byler, I think, is particularly interesting because he's drawing on critiques of Western processes of settler colonialism uh, and particularly looking at the literature on colonial dispossession to explain how these processes are affecting Uyghur lives. So let, let's think now specifically about the role of music within these processes of um, transformation and dispossession. Uh, oh, sorry, I put a quote up there. I'll give you a minute to have a look at that. This, this is really Darren Byler. Um, focusing on the question of uh, native or indigenous peoples and the way that um, they experience this kind of shift under um, under colonial dispossession and the, the rise of these capitalist frameworks um, and the way that their, their bodies and their imaginations are integrated into the new system. So to music, um, and first um, a word about music and its um, uses uh, within the camp system. Um, apologies if you've seen me play these clips before, but I think they are really uh, very important to bear in mind when we start thinking about the wider context. So this, this is really to think about music uh, and the way it's used inside the camps as really a form of, of disciplining Muslim bodies. Um, and one song in particular stands out in the testimonies of camp survivors. Uh, and that is the, the classic Chinese revolutionary song, uh, which goes, without the Chinese Communist Party, there is no new China. 
Let's see if I can just play you a little bit of that. Yes, so that is um, uh, a very, very widespread song um, composed even before the um, establishment of the People's Republic of China uh, back in the 1930s, I think it was. Um, it was played, for example, at the, the, the great um, celebrations in 2019 of, of National Day, a massive parade on uh, Tiananmen Square in Beijing. Um, and it is also um, repeatedly referred to in, in these testimonies by camp survivors who talk about the way that um, they were uh, required to sing this particular song uh, before getting their meals. Um, there are um, accounts of how the whole camp was required to sing in chorus before they got their food repeatedly and they were urged by guards to sing louder, to sing with more enthusiasm. Let's have a little listen to that. <laughs> Yeah, so a much bleaker rendition than <laughs> this little clip um, was uh, circulating on Uyghur WhatsApp also in 2019. Uh, so this kind of training in singing revolutionary songs then is part of that um, whole system of submission to the camp regime, good performance of this song alongside other aspects of good behavior. So self-criticism, um, dedicated study of the writings of Xi Jinping, all of this may eventually permit individuals to be released into at least the slightly rigorous, less rigorous context of um, factory labor. So we, we can understand this um, through the lens of Foucault uh, and his writing on biopolitics, the, these um, systems of self-discipline and self-objectification uh, really um, rely on the interiorization of neoliberal ethics, or here neoliberal ethics with Chinese characteristics, shall we say. Uh, so this is um, a system, of course, underpinned by physical control of bodies through securitization and surveillance. Um, and where the goal is really to mold the self into a patriotic subject who just submits to and also embodies the norms of development under the leadership of the party and all of the racialized hierarchies that that entails. So with all of this in mind, let's think about uh, tourism and song and dance. So. Um, there are many uh, glowing reports in China's state media at the moment about the um, huge success story, which is tourism in Xinjiang, um, the, the, the huge numbers who, who now visit um, it reached 100 million visitors in 2017, uh, 200 million visitors in 2019, and these, these numbers are still going up. Um, then there are narratives of business opportunity uh, in Xinjiang, which are circulating widely in the state media. Um, they talk about how the tourism industry in this region has diversified. So um, during the Winter Olympics, for example, there was quite a lot of emphasis on uh, winter sports in the north of the region. Uh, you can also take a luxury train tour. And of course, there is a lot of um, historical and cultural tourism, which is really the topic of um, interest for me. Uh, there are a lot of claims that tourism has produced thousands of new jobs in the region, uh, as well as improving transportation infrastructure. Um, so a few things to note. Um, 
as with the development of the factories in this region, as is now well documented, um, the tourist industry is also overwhelmingly dominated by firms that are based in central China and the profits flow back to the east. Um, so let's take a look at the tourist experience specifically in Kashgar, uh, that historical Silk Road city. Um, the city's architecture has been extensively remodeled over the past uh, few decades uh, and its inhabitants have been uh, quite extensively relocated to permit um, tourist development. So here in this image you see the uh, newly built ancient city wall of Kashgar, where tourists entering the city are welcomed by Uyghur dancers, uh, costumed soldiers, and also a drum and shawm band. I don't know if you can see my cursor there. That, that is the, um, is that the shawm player there? You can see the, the drummers up on the wall there. So let, let's think about um, drum and shawm bands for a minute. Um, this uh, reminded me of um, a blog uh, on our project website, Sounding Islam in China, if I may do a bit of shameless promotion for a minute. Um, we, we have a really great article about these drum and shawm bands uh, written by my colleague Rahila Dawut. Um, who is still detained in the camp system uh, now um, for five years. Uh, and her blog is based really on quite extensive fieldwork that she undertook um, in this region. And it tells some of the stories of Sean players, um, particularly the musicians who used to play at the big festivals. Uh, which were held at uh, the shrine, uh, the Ordam shrine in particular. Uh, this, this was a shrine built for the martyr Ali Aslan Khan, who was one of the most important transmitters of Islam into the region um, in the 10th, 11th century in that period. And he was killed in battle uh, with the Buddhist kingdom of Khotan uh, and has been remembered ever since. You can see there one of the photos that she took of the musicians processing towards the shrine along well-trodden pilgrim routes. Um, the, the shrine itself is now bulldozed uh, and the songs, of course, are silenced, although we, we do have a few recordings on our website still. Uh, so back to the city wall, maybe some of those musicians have found a living um, playing on top of this fake wall. <laughs> um, I've, I've previously spoken and written quite a bit about um, processes of state territorialization in Xinjiang, um, by which I mean the way that this, this territory is produced through various mechanisms, really um, as a natural part of the People's Republic of China. And I've spoken especially about the role of song and dance in these processes. So there are, there are so many examples of this, just, just with this um, image and these, these stories that I've been sharing here, um, the brand new ancient um, city wall of Kashgar, you can see how histories are, are literally being bulldozed and re-erected, reformed and re-erected. So let's think again, with David Harvey about the relationship between the territoriality of political power and the spatiality of capital accumulation and think specifically about um, tourism in uh, Xinjiang. And actually there's an excellent article just out, uh, co-authored by um, one of my colleagues, Henrik Sadzuski, uh, which is addressing exactly this topic. Uh, and this article then lays out the, the principal issues, I think, very clearly. Um, at the same time as prohibiting prayer and religious education for the Uyghurs, the Chinese state organizes folkloric expressions of Uyghurness, uh, traditional costume and dance. Um, and this really is uh, a process of 
Uyghurs being transformed into sanitized objects of touristic consumption. Uh, so we can read tourism uh, as a technology of state territorialization and a mode of social and spatial or ordering. And this, of course, is not uh, unique to, to this region. There's quite an extensive literature on tourism making these kind of arguments and talking specifically about the tourist gaze, which I think is quite helpful. So this idea that the tourist gaze renders Uyghur culture, religion and history for a primarily Han audience. So the wider literature then is very um, keen to um, emphasize that the tourist gaze is not only a visual um, trope, but also um, incorporates sounds, smells and tastes, the whole sensorium of touristic delights. So let's um, see what's been dished up in Xinjiang. Uh, and this this is um, a little clip um, from a musical which was released in 2021 uh, called The Wings of Song in English. Uh, and this is um, uh, a little song performed by um, Abd Karim Ablis. <laughs> Okay, now the risk of making you all terribly hungry uh, if that is your um, chosen style of cuisine. <laughs> Um, so the sensorium of delights is, is fully on display there. Uh, I've just given you a little clip. Uh, in terms of the, the, the lyrics, also interesting, um, Abdekirim, a Uyghur singer, um, a well-known comedian and singer, is um, singing in Chinese, if that's not obvious. Come on, friends, he sings, um, forming part of a pattern of really decades of welcoming uh, Chinese friends to, to the Uyghur region. Um, Abdekirim has been lucky enough or smart enough to have escaped um, a period in the camps, although of course many of his um, colleagues have not been so fortunate. And here he's really, I would say, performing Uyghurness for the colonial gaze, for the tourist gaze, producing this uh, sensorially rich, exotic, but welcoming experience for the tourists. Uh, and there are many things that really jar about this for me. One is the, um, the comical accented Chinese accent that he produces, Lai Sa, Lai Sa. Um, really, um, I would compare this to, to forms of blackface minstrelsy. Uh, this also, I would suggest, is um, a form of coerced labour, of course. So the, this musical, uh, interestingly, it wasn't exactly a big box office hit across China. Um, very few of my students seem to have heard of, about it last year. But it was made compulsory viewing in educational settings across Xinjiang. Uh, so it, it seems to me that a production like this is um, serving not only tourist promotion, uh, but also teaching Uyghurs about their place in, in the new order. So although these um, bigger media representations tend to privilege uh, male stars like Abdekirim, in fact, by far the largest group of workers in music for the tourism industry are young Uyghur women uh, performing Uyghur dance for tourists in quite small settings. 
um, for example, um, in after dinner entertainment at small Uyghur restaurants. Um, let me show you a clip of this kind of um, musical tourism then. This is um, a clip that I, I grabbed from YouTube where it's been copied from the Chinese um, Yoku platform. <laughs> Oh, okay. That was short and sweet. Um, yeah, so that um, uh, I grabbed from YouTube, as I say, uh, it was on a, an account labeled hot Xinjiang dance <laughs> uh, and you can see there the costume and the dancing style um, that this this woman is reproducing is really based on professional styles of song and dance troupe performance um, recalling traditional Uyghur dance but it is a bit more spicy um, and the recorded song is really uh, typical Uyghur pop, um, a, a wedding song, that is, a celebration song. So, um, yeah, this, this was where I found another speaker in this series, very helpful. Uh, this is Anna Hoffman, of course, and her discussion of effective labour, affective labour. Uh, and so Hoffman is thinking about music and dance performance as effective labor that is as work intended to produce or modify emotional experiences. Uh, and this framework um, is very helpful, I think, if we are thinking through the gendered nature of effective labor uh, in this region, which is primarily performed by young Uyghur women. Um, it impels us to think about the economics of this form of labor, which is not really something people have done before. Um, and also the specifics of the structural relationships here between the music worker and the patrons. So if you think through a little bit about what we, we've just seen there, this is a very common scene, one that I experienced myself, um, I mean, going back quite some years actually in this region. Uh, and this is very informal, uh, precarious labour, if you like, very local. Um, uh, I th would expect in this context that the, the restaurant is being paid by the tour company to provide both food and entertainment, uh, and that the local restaurant, which itself might be Uyghur run, is um, sourcing the da dancer. So she is um, practically um, self-employed. Uh, the the restaurant will probably um, provide the sound system to play her backing track and would pay her cash. Hmm. So I think it's interesting also to compare what we see here with some research done by Sam Haller, um, who is now based in Yunnan, I think, but um, did his PhD at Durham University in the UK. So Sam, uh, wrote his PhD, um, now published as a book, in fact, um, about street performers in, in the city of Wuhan, uh, a Chinese city, which <laughs> must be quite familiar uh, to you for other reasons. Um, so the, these street performers in Wuhan, uh, this is really referring to also to young women, singers who were performing on makeshift stages on the streets in return for tips from their largely male audience. And Sam Haller's research is, is very strongly based on ethnography, on interviews, on close observation. And he highlights a very complex set of musical, effective and financial exchanges involved in these street performances, really showing the close-up ethnographic research is essential 
to really get to the heart of questions of the relations between tourism, development, and the forms of employment that are available for local people. And I think this is really crucial if we're going to um, really get inside these kind of easy state narratives about development and um, uh, the, the value of the tourist in industry in this region and think um, carefully about how the money actually trickles down to local people and what is their experience of labour within this new system which is uh, I'm sure set to become even more dominant in future years. And of course for foreigners like myself now access is extremely difficult so this, this is research that I think really needs to be done um, by, by Chinese students and researchers, also not entirely uncomplicated for them, of course. There we go. So uh, one more thing that I found helpful um, about Anna Hoffman's approach to this idea of affective labour was her critique of uh, what she calls the dominant ahistorical approach to questions of affect and musical performance. Um, so she's really emphasising the need to explore the specific conditions and histories that underpin forms of gendered affective labour. So this, this got me thinking through uh, the whole kind of history of song and dance in China. And of course, it, it's really interesting to think about um, the early days of the Chinese Communist Party. So say in the, the 1950s in this region, and um, party attempts to, to raise the status of women by drawing them out of the home and into roles as singers or dancers in the new song and dance troops, very common kind of trope at that point. And then moving into the 1980s and 90s, perhaps, we can think of the development of minority, um, ethnic minority song and dance troops and the way that they were increasingly used to perform belonging, belonging to the, uh, the, the wider Chinese nation and um, especially uh, their smiles. <laughs> this is a very common trope in scholarship, the smiling um, ethnic minority performer who demonstrates how happy they are to belong to the big family of the Chinese nation uh, and also the, um, the concomitant rise of a, a fascination with the exotic and erotic minority women. Of course, um, some of you in the room will be rec uh, recognising the words of um, uh, Drew Gladney. Um, a senior colleague who very sadly passed away quite recently. Um, and we can also um, perhaps think of the, the work of Louisa Shine, another anthropologist working in southwest China, who's really traced the shift from the formal state produced um, song and dance troops into the tourism industry. And Louisa Shine, I mean, also back in the, the 2000s, was talking about the close-up encounters between tourists and young minority women and how this really produced a special class of vulnerable and devalued workers um, whose smiles, particularly in contemporary Xinjiang, I would argue, um, and whose effective labour are really underpinned by structural and uh, physical violence. Yeah, so um, that's about it for me. I, a very brief conclusion, um, just to say that um, I'd like to offer this, this talk really as a preliminary attempt to open a door for future research. I'd like to propose that in our research and in our campaigns on forced labor in Xinjiang, that we should really be paying more attention to these young women uh, they form a significant class of exploited workers whose affective labour is really a crucial element in the creation of capital under the new model of development in the region. Uh, their, their images 
are really ubiquitous, but we know far too little about their experience. So that's it. Thank you. Oh, I did have a rather large um, load of um, references if anyone wants to take a look at those. <laughs>